Welcome everyone to the 30-minute Midas Touch from beautiful Dyersburg, Tennessee at the Herb Welsh Wrestleplex. Now, here is pound for pound and inch for inch, the best of the best in professional wrestling today. A wrestling genius worth his weight in gold. The Golden Boy, Greg Anthony. Welcome everybody to this edition of the 30-minute Midas Touch. I am your host, the Golden Boy, Greg Anthony. And with me, as always, is my co-host, the King of the Mountain, <laughs> Mark Tipton. <laughs> the King of the Mountain. Well, with all apologies to Jeff Jarrett, uh, I don't know that I quite uh, have earned that that kind of moniker, but I do appreciate you assigning it to me. And, and it does take us in the direction of what is going to be today's subject matter. Uh, this will probably be an edition of the 30 Minute Midas Touch podcast in which I need the host to be a more even keeled to try to keep me under control. Uh, today we're going to focus on a particular promotion, and it's a promotion that, from the perspective of a fan, I've had a long term love hate relationship with. And that will probably come out during the course of our conversation. Uh, but that subject matter is the racing promotion known as, well, let's say, total nonstop action, now known as Impact Wrestling. Many refer to it simply as TNA. Yeah. Um, you know, TNA, like we talked about, you know, it's been in business since 2002. You know, it, ha it has a long history, and like, just like you, I – I kind of have a love-hate relationship with it. So I think the first place we need to start is kind of like how did it all like actually come about? You know, I don't know if anyone's ever heard the story or not. But um, so when Jeff Jarrett was in uh, WWF, WWE, um, apparently there was a situation where um, he, it was time for his contract renewal. And um, him and Jim Ross and whoever had made an agreement about what kind of money he was going to make on when he signed his new deal. Well, a couple months later, they, they went back on that deal and signed them for less money, right? Okay, so then when Jeff Jarrett's contract renewal came up again, you know, uh, later, they actually, it passed without anyone ever knowing it, right? And like, and he was the Intercontinental Champion, so it was one of those big flubs in the office, you know, where, um, you know, his contract had expired and he was the champion, now they're in this situation, Right? So, and the, of course, this story's been told several times, and there's there's all, all kinds of different numbers. But basically what happened was they were, you know, um, they wanted Jeff Jarrett to drop the title to China, and he said he would for X amount of dollars, right? And then he said he uh, he eventually went to Jim Ross and said, hey, you know that, that number I told you that I do? Double that, because that's for, you know, screwing me on my, my contract the last time. You know, so we don't know how much it was. Some people say it was two hundred fifty thousand. Some people say it was four hundred thousand. You know, it's it's one of those things that gets kind of lost in translation over the years. So Jarrett took his two hundred fifty thousand or however much it was, did the match, left immediately after. You know, didn't even, I don't think he even stuck around or just actually walked out of the arena in the clothes that he wore, got it straight into the car and left. You know, and uh, like I said, eventually he he hooked up with his dad and they decided they were going to create an alternative you know, to uh, the WWE, which, of course, like you said, became total non sub action. All right. If you'll pardon my fandom question here, I'm trying to recall now, when he was working with China at that time, was this the good housekeeping match? Yes, yes. That, was, right. that, was, the, that was the final blow, was a good housekeeping match. Right. That, that certainly stuck out in my mind. Uh, and so, but uh, that's interesting because here we have an instance, we mentioned wrestling politics from time to time, Here's where it is. A contract dispute results in a very dramatic change in the history of professional wrestling. Uh, I guess what we'll start with is what were your feelings when you first heard that Jeff and Jerry Jarrett, the way I first heard it, were rumblings is. Now, this was in the not that long after the demise of WCW. Yeah. There were many wrestling fans, and I was one of them, terribly heartbroken at the demise of WCW. I'm someone who feels that having multiple national promotions is good for professional wrestling. Having more outlets, more places for wrestlers to perfect their cat, their craft, excuse me, is good for professional wrestling in general. And I'm a fan of professional wrestling, not necessarily any three letters you wish to assemble. And then I heard that Jeff and Jerry Jarrett, two guys, obviously, 
Tennessee based, someone who people I'm familiar with and have a you know high opinion of, they're planning on start a promotion. How did you first hear about this coming together? Uh, well, it's one of those things that kind of, there's kind of rumblings in the business because this this is 2001, 2002, and this is you know I've been in the business since 2000, so I kind of start hearing hey something's going on in Nashville. You know what I mean? They're talking about this, they're talking about that. So it was, it was kind of one of those rumblings that we kind of heard in the locker room first, and of course one, once it hit the dirt sheets. You know, as far as like, yeah, they were gonna they were gonna start their own promotion. It, it was an exciting time because obviously, uh, WCW going under had left a void. You know what I mean? Um, WWE obviously became the the biggest game in town, and like, it was just you know, like I said, there was a void there. Someone needed to have an alternative to them, whatever that may be, and uh, with it being a Jerry Jarrett, Jeff Jarrett kind of uh, collaboration. To me, it was going to be Southern style, so that that was that was of interest to me too. It's more of a Southern based wrestling company as where WWE is more obviously Northeast. Um, so I, w- I was excited, and it, I think a, a lot of the, my peers were excited too. Like, hey, this may be an opportunity for us to get an opportunity. All right. Well, that see that certainly that certainly kind of perspective I had when I first heard about this coming about. And uh, I mentioned the love hate, and I might even say a roller coaster uh, history in my fandom of TNA slash Impact, as it's now known. The next thing I heard that kind of gave me pause was when I heard what they were going to name the promotion. Uh, would you like to talk about the name? The literally, it's known as TNA, and yeah. my, how that came about from your understanding and so forth. Yeah, I mean, we were just coming off, like, Jared had, you know, obviously um, created quite a quite a fan base through the Attitude Era. You know, that's really when he kind of hit a, a really good stride with who Jeff Jarrett was as a performer and a character and whatever. And that's kind of what he carried over to WCW, that same look, and that's kind of look he had through the remainder of his career was that King of the Mountain, Jeff Jarrett, you know, WCW chosen one, you know, slap nuts kind of thing, you know. So um, I think for him, you know, it was just kind of, like, kind of oh, this is t- let's let's name it something tongue in cheek. You know, everybody says they want they want uh, TNA in wrestling. Well, let's give it to them. Let's give them TNA. Let's give them total nonstop action. You know what I mean? So I'm not a big fan of that. I'm always a fan of you know, a hey, wrestling needs to be in the name. You know, years ago, we had a company around here called Elite Wrestling Entertainment. Well, originally, they wanted to call it Elite Entertainment. And I chimed in with the fact, hey, are will people know we're a wrestling company or they think we're a strip club? And everybody goes, good point. And then they, they end up going with Elite Wrestling Entertainment instead of Elite Entertainment. Um so yeah, along those same lines, I'm a big fan of hey, let's you know we're wrestling, so let's put wrestling somewhere in the name. So yeah, I wasn't I wasn't too thrilled with the name, but there was you're forgetting there was also three year letters before that TNA in the beginning, and that was the NWA. So it was NWA TNA, right? Yeah, well there you go. That was certainly uh, actually next on the one of the agenda items I want to discuss because when they did begin. Uh, they and let me see if I do recall that I believe the ten pounds of gold was present at their first pay per view, as I recall. Yeah, they crowned a, they crowned the new champion that night, and I believe it was in Birmingham, Alabama. Yeah, maybe. I, was it in Nashville or Birmingham? I I, I want to say the first one was in Birmingham, and then they moved to Nashville later. I'm sure I yeah. will be corrected by yeah. the audience if I get that wrong. Right, right. I stand to be corrected. Um, but they did bring in the history and kind of the legacy we'll say of the nwa and made it part of their brand new promotion so you have a brand new promotion with a very established brand name which does make a lot of sense and i suppose that's where you're going with that yeah because and and the nwa as much as we don't agree with them in today's day and age you understand the nwa you know is is still very important to the history of my career still important to the history of wrestling in general and anytime a major promotion wants to become a major promotion They've used the NWA to do it. You understand? Um, WWE obviously originally was a member, of the, or at least Vince Senior was a member, a board member of the NWA. Um, when they broke away from the NWA, that's when they created their own world title, and Buddy Rogers was the first champion, things like that. Uh, WCW obviously became came from the Crockett's NWA, so its its history was there too. Same thing with ECW. Shane Douglas threw down the NWA world title to create the ECW world heavyweight title. 
um, TNA, no different. They, they established, hey, we're going to be the 10 pounds gold. The most important world title in the history of our business is now this is our focal point. That was huge. AEW, same difference. When they wanted to get some exposure, what did they do? Cody Rhodes versus Aldis for the NWA world title. You understand? So everyone's used the NWA to establish th their promotions over the years, um, and this is just another indication of them doing that. All right. Well, one of the things that uh, really TNA became known for off the bat um, was what I would consider a bit of an innovation. And I want to see how you feel about this because when I became aware that they were not going to pursue a cable television package right off the beginning, their intention was, and I have heard this was a idea proposed by Bob Ryder, who had him involved with WCW, and he was someone who was friends to some degree with the Jarrett's and he may have helped come up with this notion and that was the idea of having a weekly pay-per-view traditionally uh, professional wrestling had a weekly cable presence with a monthly pay-per-view they decided to kind of sidestep that and go to a a plan of a weekly pay-per-view how did you feel about that well, I don't know if that was necessarily their their initial plan I think maybe it was just by necessity because they couldn't get an actual weekly television gig, a national television gig. So what's our alternative? Well, we can offer this. And basically what they were doing, you know, back then the, you know, the pay-per-views were usually about 30 bucks a month, right? So if you bought the monthly package, you got all their events for about 30 bucks. So equal, equal out. It was the same as getting WWE's pay-per-view every year, but you were getting all the content of, of them. But I don't know. I'm, I'm still a big fan of obviously, you know, you know, wrestling on television, you know, and then drawing people into money matches that they'll pay for eventually, you know, whether it be at a live show or a pay-per-view or whatever it may be. So, like I said, I don't know if this was – this probably wasn't their first option, but they tried to make the best of it, you know, and it was it was different. You know, I mean, I, did, I personally only bought, like, a few of them, you know, during that time period, but it, I had friends that bought every one of them, you know what I mean? So I would hear about it and kind of hear results and things like that, and this is obviously – way before YouTube, really, and all that kind of stuff, so we couldn't really get a lot of the stuff. So there's a lot of that early TNA stuff that I didn't get to see that I've, I've went back over the years and kind of tried to dig up. All right. Well, they did go with that for a time period, but there did come a time where they decided it was they wanted to go in a more traditional format. Now, uh, at that time, they moved to Fox Sports Net. Uh, and let me say, up until that point, their weekly pay-per-views – for those of you who remember, had been taking place at the Tennessee State Fairgrounds. And then they were moving to Universal Studios in Orlando, Florida, and began their relationship with Fox Sports Net. This involved the implementation of what was referred to as a more sports-based presentation. Uh, did you have any opinions on the way the Fox Sports Net version of TNA was um, Yeah, I liked – I mean, it hit its stride, really, as far as production – Start go. I mean, obviously, the Universal Studios was a much cleaner look than the the Nashville Fairgrounds. You know what I mean? Like as historic as that building is, you know, I've wrestled in it a few times myself, um, and it's a it's a great venue. But at the same time, like you know, Universal Studios just had all the bells and whistles for like a like a live TV taping kind of thing. So um, yeah, and, and they used to do like the little uh, the little. Um, lower tier thing at the bottom of the screen that showed, you know, who was wrestling each other and how much time limit was there and stuff like that. So I like that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, the product itself, like, and I think this has kind of been indicative of, it, of TNA from, from the beginning. It's just, there's no genuine leadership. You know what I mean? And we look at, you know, all the opportunities that they've had, you know, it, there is no other company that will exist that had more opportunity to dethrone WWE than TNA did. Because if you look at TNA, if you look at TNA's roster from, let's say, 2007, I'm going to read you these names, and I just want everyone to marvel at the, at the kind of talent that they had available to them in 2007. A1, AJ Styles, Abyss, Alex Shelley, Andy Douglas, Angelina Love, Austin Aries, Austin Creed, who became Xavier, Xavier Woods. Woods yes. Awesome Kong, BG James, uh, Basham, Doug Basham, Black Rain, who is Goldust, Bob Backlund, Bobby Roode, Booker T, Brother Devon, and Brother Bubba Ray. <laughs> Brother Ray. 
uh, Chase Stevens, Chris Harris, Chris Saban, Christian Cage, Christopher Daniels, Christy Hemme, Damaja, Dave Penzer, Dixie Carter, Don West, Dutch Mantell, Elix Skipper, Eric Young, Gail Kim, Glenn Gilberti, Hernandez, Homicide, Jacqueline, James Mitchell, James Storm, Jay Lethal, Jeff Jarrett, Jeremy Borash, Jerry Lynn, Jim Cornette, Jimmy Rave, Johnny Devine, Johnny Stamboli, Judas Messiah, Karen Angle, Kaz, Kevin Nash, Kip James, also known as Billy Gunn, Conan, Kurt Angle, Lance Hoyt, Matt Morgan, Mike Tanay, ODB, Petey Williams, Pierre Carl Ouellette, also known as PCO now, Raven, Rhino, Rick Steiner, Rikishi, Ron Killings, Roxy, Samoa Joe, Scott Demore, Scott Hall, Scott Steiner, Sinchi, who is low key, Shane Douglas, Shark Boy, Charmel, So Calval, Sanjay Dutt, Spike Dudley, Sylvan Grenier, T- Tyson Tomko, Tracy Brooks, Velvet Sky, and Sting. <laughs> Oh, by the way. By the way. Yeah, we also got <clears throat> Sting. By the way, the man they call Sting, as I'm so fond of calling him. Now, the, on that list, that brings me into a time period. After the Fox Sports Net, in my opinion, it never really caught traction. Now, I will admit, I very rarely watch the Fox Sports Net product. Uh, I, you know, the current phrase is, people get in their feelings. Well, leaving Nashville to move to Orlando had me in my feelings as a fan. <laughs> Uh, I did get over it, as we all do in life. and But after the Fox Sports Net, they moved to Spike TV, and I think that's along the time frame of the talent roster that you're talking about there. Yeah, I would say that was probably the golden age. Would that be fair to say? Uh, I know in particular now some of the people we mentioned there, there's obviously the famous um, – right off the top of the list, one of the names you mentioned was A.J. Styles. Full of, of mention of my biases, he is one of my favorites, and I really credit him as a TNA guy. Now, I had seen him at some point as part of an, I want to say, NWA wild side, mm-hmm. I believe. And he was in NWCW at the end, too. Yes, well, that, <laughs> very, very. Yeah, well, my, my fandom showing again. That era of WCW, something I try to. You the wipes from remember. Yeah, as, as like be, Total Recall. As best, as best I can. Right. Uh, but. He was someone who I immediately identified as a TNA guy. And along with that tremendous roster of guys who could put together a tremendous product. And in there, they really had a good thing going with Spike TV, did you feel? At least I felt. Did you feel the same? Yeah, yeah. Like, with Spike TV, I really felt they had a huge opportunity to do some things. Because, like I said, you know, they, they had more opportunity than anyone else had or probably will ever have. Because that roster that I just named – that's ridiculous. Like, listen to all the stud horses and all the guys that were huge stars name-wise in the world of professional wrestling that were in that roster. You know, Kevin Nash, Rick Steiner, Kurt Angle, you know, Sting. I mean, it just goes on and on. And then, like you said, and mix it with the guys that were were complete workhorses like an AJ Styles and a Samoa Joe and, like, uh, Chris Saban and Alex Shelley and guys like that. You know, you put all that kind of – that mix together – and you've got a really, really healthy mix of new and young, and, and you know you can start building stars from a lot of that. But that's where they fail to do so. They they fail to to get over that hump and create that kind of buzz because there was never any concernable direction. You know, as far as a booker goes, you know, your job is to is to point the ship in a direction and go that way. You know, well. The ship changed course so much in TNA that it was almost impossible. You know, one week they would tell us that. You know, Sting is the future of the company, and he's the champion, blah, blah, blah. And then the next week it would be Jeff Hardy. And then after that it would be Ken Kennedy and then RVD. It was like it was just a revolving door at the top. You know what I mean? When it should be – it's a ladder. You know, you're supposed to go up and come back down and go up and come back down instead of, you know, just like a mobile over a baby's crib. It just goes round and round. You know, so it was the same guys going round and round, but no one could ever find a, a clear direction of this is what's best for the company. Let's go that way. All right, I'd like to kind of uh, backtrack and, and get around the subject that you just brought up because as you went through that roster and we talked about all the things that the company had going for it, one of the real issues has really from its inception. Uh, we I heard it as from the beginning described as Jeff and Jerry Jarrett. However, very early on, and I looked, I did not write down the exact date, but very early on in the process, Panda Energy bought a ownership stake which of course introduced later i don't know if she was a prominent role at the beginning but dixie carter 
became a part of it. Um, do you want to say anything about it? Yeah, and that's the thing. Like, okay, so running a wrestling company and running a successful wrestling company are two different things, okay? People d- determine success in many different ways is the problem. You know, I determine success if the, if the money-wise, you stay in the black, right? You make money. That would be considered a profitable business. Well, for some reason, the world of professional wrestling, profit, for some reason, has lost people's lingo. You understand? So, like, when they say, I run a successful wrestling company, they could, they could mean, well, hey, we book WWE stars 12 times a year, and we do this, and we do that, and we, we have 300 people in our building every, every month, but, you know, our payroll is $20,000, you know, so we don't make any money, but you know what? We put on a damn good show, you know what I mean? So, so like I said, running a, a wrestling company, running a proper wrestling company, uh, Jeff Jarrett has said, I believe, before that, you know, he just doesn't have the skill set to be the president, the the number one guy, the one guy that makes all the decisions in a wrestling company. I, I'm sure he's a great agent, you know, got a great mind for the business in that sense, but he said that just that particular role is something he can't fill. So in the early days, you know, obviously he was having trouble with his, him and his dad don't get along anyway, which is, you know, you can look, everyone can look that up. They, they've had a storied history with each other. To this date, I don't know if they've even talked for the last 20 years, I think. They had a huge falling out, but so uh, Jerry left early, and like I said, Panda Energy came in because it was going to go under. It, it was going to go under, and Panda Energy came in and saved it. Um, and I don't know if it ever turned a profit ever. You know what I mean? I remember when you know AEW was talking about, oh, we're gonna you know we're gonna draw ten thousand people. We're gonna you know be the only non WWE company to do that in the last thirty years. And I started thinking about that. And I saw when did some research, and like TNA, even at its height like had only drawn like 6,000, 7,000 people to one of their biggest events. And to me, that was kind of mind boggling. Like, especially when you think about that roster we just named, right? Like I've seen bookers with a lot less talent, you know, do a lot more with it. Right. And here we have, you know, this amazing talent pool, you know, and it just, it just went nowhere. It seemed like, um, so yeah, that, that, it always comes back to booking and always comes back to money and it always comes back to those things. But like, yeah, TNA like had all the opportunity in the world and just felt like it got squandered. And uh, <clears throat> I probably shouldn't hit on this again, but <clears throat> excuse me. My, my recollection was even from the very beginning when the issue of naming the company, what they named it, that was a source of dissension between Jeff and Jerry, as I recall, because I certainly at the time thought Jerry Jarrett is going along with this. And uh, apparently he wasn't. But uh, that brings in, but Dixie Carter, you have someone without a wrestling background. And it to me, it appeared that this was something that was almost a pet project for her, handed to her by her father, who ran Panda Energy, is my understanding. Well, I mean, the rumor was that, you know, Dixie Carter and Jeff Jarrett n- knew each other from the old Nashville days, like the old the old 80s days, the late eighties, early nineties days. And that's kind of where it came on. You know, Jeff called his old buddy Dixie, who, you know, dad is a billionaire or whatever he may be. And, <laughs> and you know, asked for the bailout pretty much. And like, they made a deal like that. But yeah, once again, we talked about this before. Like I, I have no problem with, with people outside of professional wrestling, getting involved in wrestling to a certain aspect. But at the end of the day, you have to have someone of wrestling making decisions. And that was kind of the thing. Like I would hear stories about Dixie Carter uh, being in um, being in negotiation meetings with talent, and they were heel talents, right? And her saying things like, well, I just don't see paying you as much as I pay them because the, the, the crowd cheers them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that total – like. How, how many levels can you can you miss on, on when you're doing something like that? So yeah, it's like it just if you want to say money mark, I mean that's that's a huge that's a huge thing. Yeah, money mark. Same thing with Tony Khan, huge money mark, the biggest money mark in history at this point. So yeah, like I said, I don't I, like I like an outside perspective, but at the same time, you know, it has to be reined in by someone with um, expert knowledge in professional wrestling. All right. Well, thank you for using that term. I was sitting in my sitting back in my chair with my head in my hands trying to decide if I wanted to mention that term because that's really what that screams, that comment. 
but I'd like to move us forward a little bit. We've seen lots of fits and starts with the management side of TNA, and they made a decision which caused me a great deal of concern at the time, and I was, for good reason, as I found out later on. They decided to bring in, to help kind of revitalize the company at one point, Eric Bischoff and the immortal Hulk Hogan. Yeah, I mean, I as a fan, like I was intrigued by that. You know, here we are. You know, it's it's Hogan and Bischoff. It's are they going to be able to have the same equal the same success they had in WCW and give Vince another run for his money? Um, you know, that first night that I watched, you know, it was it was intriguing. You know, what I mean, it was new, it was exciting. Yeah, they didn't necessarily have to have X Pac and Scott Hall and and the Nasty Boys and and just guys that you know. Let's bring them out from under a rock, you know, put them on television, you know. But, like, it, it was new and it was fresh, and I understood where they were going. But after about a month of it, it was just kind of same old, same old. You know what I mean? So it's just one of those things, you like, you have to – and we said this before. People, people think that I'm very – like, I don't like progress in wrestling. That's not true. It's just I want, I want it to progress as professional wrestling. I don't want it to progress as something else. There's, already, there's enough everything else out there. I want professional wrestling. So I want it to progress but still but still keep the the core values that made professional wrestling great. And I think that was what was always lacking with TNA was um you know they if they did try something it was so far out of the realm, you know what I mean? Like it just didn't make any sense and there was no continuity to the booking at all. All right. Well, one of the one of the decisions they made that really uh, I disliked from the moment I heard they were going to do this, and I'll let you describe about this, is they decided to go head-to-head with Monday Night Raw. They moved from their, I believe it was a Thursday night time slot. They arranged to move to go head-to-head with the biggest show in the world of professional wrestling at the time and take on Vince, I suppose. Yeah, that was, I mean, if you look at it now, that's obviously a very ill-timed move. It would probably have been better for them to stay on Thursday nights and kind of establish themselves and what they are and what they're doing than if the numbers suggested and if they got, and gained enough steam, yeah, let's let's go head-to-head with them. Let's, let's make a go for it. But, like, they had no other than, hey, Hogan and Bischoff are in charge now. You know, what, what really indications do they have? Now, what TNA did well, and we don't talk about a lot, is, you know, um, they capitalized on things that WWE wasn't capitalized on, in, uh, capitalized on, in, on at the time. And, you know, that's like the X division. The X division was basically a souped up cruiserweight division where it was, you know, it wasn't weight limits. It was no limits, you know, and you had guys like Samoa Joe and Christopher Daniels and AJ Styles that started in there and stuff like that. And they were really all of the, all the kind of matches that you're seeing on all these programs nowadays that was really the birth of of that kind of stuff was in in the x division and then also you have things like you know a lot of people like to say the women's revolution started in nxt no (laughs) the women's revolution started in tna because they were the ones that really pushed the knockouts you know i mean they were the ones awesome kong and angelina love and odb and you know tracy brooks and a lot just a lot of those you know you know gail kim you know another great one i mean they were the ones that were really giving females time in their matches, letting them wrestle, main event and even some. You know, they were doing that a decade, 15 years before WWE ever thought about doing it. And then, of course, tag teams. You know, tag teams, you had, you know, you had Beer Money, you had America's Most Wanted, you had the Motor City Machine Guns, you had the Dudley Boys, or as you, uh, as you love to call them, <laughs> Team 3D. But either way, they they had they had all those elements that like if WWE wasn't capitalized on it, wrestling fans want it. Then hey, we are the alternative, and we've got that. But then once Hogan and Bischoff got there, they tried to to whitewash that stuff, I guess, you know, and try to get, try to get rid of it or tr- at least try to thin it out some. And I just don't think they I don't think they understood the product they were trying um, to live in. Well, I guess one minor but visible aspect of that was TNA had kind of developed a, a a name for itself because they had employed the use of the six-sided ring, which kind of made them stand out, I suppose, was the idea. Now, Hogan and Bischoff returned it to the four-sided ring of tradition. Um, so that kind of lets you know where they were trying to go. I suppose 
the next thing that happened is we saw where backstage issues created problems constantly. And the next thing I'd like to talk about is there was a time period in a relatively short time period where we saw the departure of both Jeff Jarrett and the one that meant a great deal to me personally as a fan was AJ Styles left TNA. Yeah, first I want to say I hated the six-sided ring. <laughs> because of all the things you're going to change in professional wrestling, why change the ring? You understand, like, that's you could you could put a ring in a car lot right now and people would go by and go, oh, that's a wrestling ring. You know what I mean? They're, it's so recognizable, there's no reason to ch- ever change it. I understand that they were trying to set themselves apart, like we said. But also from a working standpoint, it's just – it's very awkward to deal with because when you hit the rope in the middle on one side, you end up in a buckle on the other side unless you run it diagonally. You understand? So it's it's always a weird thing. Anyway. Um, so, yeah, when – um. I'm sorry. What was the question again? The- I was I was focused on when uh, Jeff. There's a time period yeah, where yeah. Jeff Jarrett and AJ left. Yeah, I mean they've had so many so much backstage drama and, and tumultuous situations. You know, like the thing with Jeff. You know, was you know he was he was banging Karen Angle. You know, and like Kurt behind Kurt's back or, or they, were they separated? I can't remember what it was, but either way he was he was messing with the man's either wife or ex-wife. And, you know, he got sent home, <laughs> you know, because Kurt Angle was obviously the biggest star in the company at that point, you know, and it was like it put everything in jeopardy. You know, that's a, that's a huge mistake, you know, as far as business goes and life in general. But, of course, Jeff and Karen ended up married and lived happily ever after, so whatever. But, I mean, from a business standpoint, it was a horrible, horrible thing. And AJ, I think he's just one of those things where, like, he just, you know, he done everything he could do and, like, you know, they, they offered him money, but it wasn't enough money. Like, you know, I've, I've established myself as this for you, you know, and you can't pay me what I'm worth, and I have to go find it elsewhere. And that's where he started going to Japan and Mexico and taking the independent bookings and things like that and eventually ended up in WWE. But, yeah, it's just it's always been it's always been kind of a roller coaster, you know, with everybody in, in, within the company, you know. And, of course, you know, Vince Russo and Jim Cornette and Dutch Mantell and Jeff Jarrett and Don West and Mike Tanay and Dixie Carter and, you know, whoever else may have been <laughs> writing or booking or whatever at the, at any point, you know. Like, it, it just – it always felt very, you know, like schizophrenic. Like, no one knew exactly what was going on. All right. I know our, our time is almost certainly drawing near, but – I do, you know, as a as a fan, I was thought, well, the person I most, as a watcher of the product, the person I most identified with their brand was AJ Styles. And as I recall, he left, got into a convertible, and literally drove away on one episode of their television. And I felt myself, I thought, well, maybe I'm going too. Uh, and, but that's, and, uh, and since we're drawing, and it's unfortunate we're drawing short because we didn't get to more of the modern day stuff, such as this is the company that helped introduce one of my least favorite subjects, the cinematic match. Uh, like I said, we're going we're to do a whole episode on, on cinematic matches and my thought process and all that, or lack thereof. But um, once again, we thank everyone for joining us here on the 30 Minute Midas Touch. I am your host, the Golden Boy Greg Anthony, for my co-host, the King of the Mountain, Mark Tipton. Thank you and goodbye.